to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. Hello and welcome to our book club. I'm Mary Menon. When you go to Kashmir, apart from the outstanding natural beauty of the valley, you will also find the architecture over there, especially the old mosques and uh, shrines, extremely beautiful. And they also represent a very unique element, an architectural narrative that is uh, very, very localized, indigenous, but yet has influences from all over. In fact, Many would argue that the monuments of Kashmir tell their own story and actually reflect history. And that's what we are going to look at as we zero in on this book, which covers the Islamic architecture, the, the, the religious Islamic architecture of Kashmir between the 14th and 18th century. Uh, this was a time when uh, the, the Kashmiri Sultanate was around all the way to the Mughals and later briefly, the Afghan sojourn there. Joining us today is uh, Hakim Samir Hamdani, who's a design director with Intag, and he has spent the last two decades actually tracking and tracing many of these monuments, which, by the way, are also in dire straits, very often uh, ignored uh, victims of apathy, and really a book like this is very important to put the spotlight on these. Uh, Samir, thanks so much for joining us today. You know, it's been a wonderful experience reading your book because honestly, I knew so little about uh, Kashmir. I've traveled over there, spent so much of time over there. But when you go to a Srinagar, you never actually look at the monuments because many of the monuments that you have actually traced are not obvious monuments that you would go and see over there. So I'm going to start by talking about what made you go into this journey and how difficult has it been, especially given that many of these monuments had to be really tracked down. Uh, most of my teenage days were in the 90s. So this is the part where Kashmir was rather very dark in terms of the overall political atmosphere. You couldn't actually move out from your home in the evening itself, leave aside going away from Srinagar city and exploring the rest of the valley. So the part of the journey as a person belonging to any place where you ex actually explore the place is these initial 20s of these years. But for me, it happened after my graduation. So because of the fact that things had started settling down in Kashmir a bit, you could move in and around, you could go down the alleys and the street. And as you move across the city, firstly, initially in the Srinagar city, there's a different feel you got because of the texture of these buildings. So unique in their own way. And so different from whatever is happening in the rest of South Asia. So this is the part wherein you became interested in the past, you became interested in your own past. I mean, that is sort of reconnecting with your own roots, which somewhere down the course of growing up were sort of lost here and there. So that is where you come back to Kashmir, you come back to Srinagar after your graduation, and then you start looking, where am I? And where is this place from? Right. Let, let's look at Kashmir. You know, um, there's this lovely image you have of the Jhelum Riverfront uh, with some of the monuments marked out. Uh, Tell us, uh, what makes the architecture, the indigenous architecture of this period between the 14th and uh, 18th century so unique uh, for a layperson? I mean, uh, uh, the whole idea would be, uh, let's uh, restart it uh, coming somewhere from, let's say, mainland uh, India, Delhi. You have the Jamia Majid in Delhi and you have a series of Jamia Majid, whether you go down west in Lahore or further down. And then you also have a Jamia in Srinagar. Essentially, in terms of the plan form, is the same plan, is the same Iranian model of doing a courtyard mosque. But then the visuals of the mosque are so located and rooted in the native architecture, native idiom of Kashmir, that it makes it so distinct. I mean, I have this, I sometimes give classes in architecture classes, and if you show them a couple of slides and you show them an image, this is a mosque, this is a mosque, what do you think about it? And the first answer is it's a temple. I mean, that is because how you visually connect to a different set of architecture, different set of aesthetic and sensibility. So once you're talking about Jalim, and again, if you look at that picture, you have residences that in between you have these temples and mosques. And the way they fit in, the vocabulary of architecture, the tapestry, the texture, how they gel in uh, with each other is what is unique about, I would say, Kashmir as a land. And that is where in that whole idea of syncretism, I mean, 
no matter how you label it and how you sort of speak about it, but that is something that is rooted. And you can actually see it in the architecture because in the end, how do you access uh, history, either through text or through archaeology? And if you do it through archaeology, if you do it through monuments, and these are monuments that are still there, you can see how uh, assimilated Kashmiri culture is in terms of the different religious groupings that are there in the society. Right. So I mean, tell me, how did the geography or the position of Kashmir really impact the way things evolved in architecture? Was it because you have made a point about the isolation as well as the interconnectivity, which is kind of juxtaposed with each other. So for uh, a beginner to understand uh, architecture and, uh, and uh, Kashmir, let's start with the geography of Kashmir. How did it influence the way things panned out? So, I mean, as you rightly said, the whole idea is it's Kashmir, it's in the Himalayas, in the middle Himalayas, and then on the north, you have the Karakuram ranges, and on the south, you have across the Peak Punjab, you have the Indian plains, the wide Indian plains. So, where does Kashmir fit in? Uh, physically, it is isolated, and at moments in its history, it chose politically to be isolated from happenings which were occurring in the rest of South Asia. But then again, it has always been at that crossroad of trade, uh, linking it to a wider region, West Asia, China, etc. So, initially, it was the salt route. Sharai Namak. Then it became the Silk Route, the Sharai Abrasion. And these are connections which have made Kashmir a part of the wider South Asia. And at certain point, it has given Kashmir that uh, physical distance and also the in terms of time, wherein it can absorb an external influence. And then, I mean, this whole idea about Kashmir is it's been a part of the uh, wider empires, whether they are coming from down south or west been a part of the Kushan Empire, it's been a part of the Guptas. So there are influences that have taken from the mainland, but then within the isolation of these Himalayan uh, mountain pole, at points of its history, it has been able to sort of rework what to accept and what to reject. And that, I think, is most integral to what forms Kashmiri identity. It's nothing that is original. It came from Kashmir as such. It is basically different motives, different elements that you are borrowed from different cultures. And then in a way, you, there's this cultural melting pot wherein you are uh, giving birth to a new language of architecture, uh, which uh, includes elements from uh, regions as wide as Mathura or Gandhara or even Chinese and Tibetan elements. So that is what is unique about Kashmir. I would say not only architecture, but the overall culture. That at points in its history, it's been able to isolate itself from the surroundings, but then it has never been a totally physically or culturally isolated from the wider South Asia or rather in the wider West Asia. What are the challenges when you look at uh, the study of architecture? Because right, like you rightly pointed out, much of it is destroyed. You have to literally go hunting for the early period. And let's look at the period that you're speaking about, 14th to 18th century. What were the challenges uh, when you were actually tracing these? So the first issue is basically the initial part, which is again in the 14th century, the part wherein there is a Muslim sultanate that is coming in Kashmir, you hardly have any archaeological trace from that part. Secondly, you don't have anything which is in the vernacular preceding Muslim rule in Kashmir. I mean, something to do with the, the way temples were built by the Hindus or the Buddhist Viharas, which are a part of the voca uh, vernacular uh, vocabulary of the region. What you have are surviving monuments, remnants, mostly monumental in stone. So the initial Muslim architecture in Kashmir borrows more from the vernacular rather than from the monumental. And again, it's rather important because if you're borrowing from monumental, you're, you're sort of competing in scale. But the initial Muslim society is sort of descaling itself. And again, this is a difference if you see what's happening in the rest of, what's happening in Delhi, the nearest neighbor to Kashmir. You see at the, the Qutub complex, the whole idea is about this new uh, politic, Muslim sultanate which is coming and it's using scale to show its presence in the wider region. But in Kashmir, the early part of Muslim rule is something about descaling itself and sort of fitting it with the surrounding uh, the physical uh, landscape. And the most uh, easy medium to do is what wood, but then wood is perishable. So the question is, how do you recreate a history uh, of architecture and buildings when you hardly have much left? So, to a certain extent, it's mostly dependent upon text and analyzing text with what was left. So we have a case for a mosque at uh, Pampur, which is known as the Mir Mosque, one of the earliest surviving examples of 
uh, Muslim religious architecture in the region. And then you compare it with what was existing, uh, maybe not within the boundaries of Kashmir itself. So there is this rather interesting case of the temple at Alchi, the Buddhist temple at Alchi, Sumta temple, which basically is a part of the vernacular vocabulary and the craftsmen were Kashmiri craftsmen. And the dating is something around 10th century in and around 10th, 11th century. So what it gives you is the idea of how influences uh, had permeated down into Kashmir itself, which were coming down from the West. So basically, Muslim presence had made it itself felt in Kashmir even before transition to Muslim rule itself. So these are things that rather help you in uh, fitting the sort of the miss missing blocks of the larger picture as it is. But again, yes, it is an issue. We don't have much in terms of archaeology in Kashmir itself.